All right, good morning. We'd like to, to welcome you to uh, Washington Street this morning for our 1030 uh, service to uh, be together and enjoy another uh, beautiful Lord's Day together. Uh, our first song this morning will be, uh, We Praise Thee, O God. Uh, if, if you'd like to, let us stand as we sing to, to start our morning here. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love. For Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light. Who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night? Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise. To the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Be seated. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you this morning, recognizing you as our creator and the giver of all good and perfect gifts. We praise your name above all names, for you are worthy. We thank you for giving us the good health to be here this morning to worship you in a way that we hope will please you. And we're just grateful for the opportunity to be able to gather as your children and worship you. And we Pray that all we say and do will bring honor and glory to your name. Father, we want to thank you for all the good people that you've placed in our lives that have influenced us for good. And we pray that you will always answer our prayers, and we thank you for answering our prayers and the prayers that you will answer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come to you in prayer and to lay our burdens down and to ask forgiveness of our sins, and to have a better relationship with you. As we go through the further walks of our life, we pray that you'll help us to be more focused on you and life eternal, to help us to live to be more Christ-like. And when our days are over, we pray that you'll carry us into your, into your eternal presence. In Christ's name, amen. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me, to say it is well, it is well with my soul. It 
it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Our song before our uh, lesson this morning, Victory, uh, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. I then obeyed his blessed commands and gained the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the stream of gold 
beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing, and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior, forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Man. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. We had a, a great, almost a full house, it looked like, this morning at 8.30. And so uh, very encouraging to see everyone this morning. Hope you're staying well and uh, prayerful for those that have been afflicted. Um, let me encourage you to be back with us tonight at 5 o'clock. Can you believe this is the first Sunday of December? December. I can't believe it's already here. But uh, being a first Sunday night, we're all back together here at five o'clock. And our most excellent youth minister, and, and, and you're with us at 1032. I said that at 830 and James was with us. I don't say it just because he's with us. But our most excellent youth minister, James Mosley, is going to be bringing the message tonight on the virtue of excellence. God gave his best for us. Why don't we give our best for him? And so... Um, I encourage you to be back with us uh, this evening uh, at 5 o'clock. Good to see all of you. Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 and bring our attention to the reading of God's Word. I don't have it on the screen this morning. I just want to encourage you to listen uh, to this wonderful story uh, together or to read it in your own Bible. I'm going to pick up in verse 21. Let's read together. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight for, of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we opened your word this morning, I pray, Father, that your voice would speak. I pray that you would speak to us through this word, that we might take this and um, apply it to our lives this week, that it would become a part of us, that we could live this story as you have given it to us. Father, I pray your blessings on those in our church and our church family who are sick, those who can't be with us today, those who are listening online. Father, I pray that you would bless them all. 
And Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this example of your servant Simeon and for Jesus most of all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have you ever had to wait on something? I mean, had to wait so anxiously that you just couldn't stand it. I can remember as a kid having to wait for Christmas. It didn't seem like Christmas was ever going to get here. And to my eight-year-old brain, now it seems like Christmas rolls around every couple of months or so. But in my little eight-year-old brain, I can remember just what seemed like forever for Christmas to get here. And then when, when it arrived, I, I can remember I just wanted, to, uh, I wanted every day to be Christmas. I wanted to hold on to that moment. I wanted it to be Christmas forever. Have you ever had to wait on something like that? Have you ever had to, had to wait? Some of you, many of you, in fact, know what it's like to wait. You know what it's like to wait for that child that you've been praying for for so long. You know what it is to wait on, on that loved one to come home. You know what it is to wait an eternity for the answer to that question that you just popped. Or, or maybe having to wait for that due date to arrive. Do you know what it's like to wait? Waiting can be excruciating, can't it? But then when the moment finally comes, you just want to hold on to it. You just want to live in that moment forever. Maybe it is that you're waiting for something this morning. As we look at Simeon in the text, Luke chapter 2 this morning, I don't know why I've always pictured Simeon as an old man, but I have. The text doesn't tell us how old he is. Maybe it's because... In verse 36, Luke goes on to tell us about Anna, and she is described uh, also with Simeon at the temple that day. But she is described as an old woman. Maybe it's the way that Simeon speaks that I've always just kind of pictured that. We don't know. But we do know that Simeon has been waiting his entire life for the consolation of Israel, for the comfort of for the, for the arrival of God's Messiah who would come and offer that special comfort to His people. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah had cried out many years before, Comfort, comfort my people, says you God. Her warfare is ended that her iniquity is pardoned. Comfort, consolation. Now it had been a long time since Isaiah had spoken those words, 800 years, in fact. What's more, it had been 400 years since any prophet of God, uh, from Simeon's perspective, since any prophet of God had heard directly from the Lord. And, and even more than that, it had been 2,000 years since God had first made that promise to Abraham and to his people, that, that his people would be a blessing to the nations. So what do you think they thought about as they waited? What do you think went through Simeon's mind? How did he feel as he waited? I know the Bible says the Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, but 2,000 years seems like a long time to have to wait. For some reason, the Spirit of God... <clears throat> had revealed to Simeon at some point in his life that he would not die until he had witnessed the coming of that consolation. And so Simeon waited. And he waited and he waited and he waited and it must have been a long time. I imagine that the years were long for Simeon. He was not living in what you would call the best of times for God's people, right? Living as he did at the, at the end of the the last century before the coming of Jesus. His people Israel were ruled over by a man who was essentially a puppet of Rome, Herod, a half-blood Jew who, was only, who had no legitimate claim to the throne and who was only king over the Jews because he had cozied up to Caesar ruling as he did with an iron fist and by the might of his military, pagan emperor in Rome. The religious leaders, the elders, 
The chief priests, the teachers of the law were hardly any better in Simeon's day. They had been so intent on holding on to their political power and their influence that they had compromised both. They had compromised the very law of God that they were sworn to uphold. And with that had gone their reputation and their respect among the people for so many. And so I wonder if Simeon, as he waited, I wonder what he thought I wonder if Simeon traveled every day to the temple, or at least every week. I wonder if every time he heard there was a baby dedication at the temple, if he hurried off to see if maybe this was the one. I wonder if he woke up every morning wondering, is this the day? Is this the day, Lord? For whatever reason, the Spirit moved him on that day. And maybe those of you who know what a thing or two about the waiting game can better appreciate than some the joy that Simeon must have felt on this day. When he showed up at the temple and and at the temple courts, he saw that young couple coming in fresh from Bethlehem with a child in their arms. He grabbed the baby into his arms, the text tells us, barely a week old. And he held him tight. I've always wondered what Mary thought about that. You know, mamas can be kind of protective, can't they? But he grabbed that baby that baby tight and he held on to him. Mary and Joseph had brought him there to dedicate him according to the customs of the law. And don't you know Joseph and Mary were good parents? Joseph, an upright, righteous man. Mary, chosen by God to be the the mother of the Messiah. You know that they were good parents. I want you to look at what Simeon says again in verse 29. Look at these words that he uh, utters in praise as he holds this child. Sovereign Lord, he said, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. Man, sovereign Lord, I can die in peace, he says. I can die a happy man because you've kept your promise. You just imagine that scene there, Simeon, holding the child in his arms. This child, this child representing the fulfillment of God's promise. You remember the first time you held your child in your arms? Those of you who are parents, do you remember? I I bet you remember the first time you held that child in your arms. How amazingly unremarkable it is. Happens all the time, right? Everybody, all over the world, people are holding their their children. And yet how amazingly remarkable it is. And especially this child. Especially this child the comfort, the reassurance, the peace that Simeon felt in that moment realizing that the long, long wait was over. He said, I've seen your salvation. I have seen your salvation. This child whose name, Jesus, whose name Jesus means the Lord has brought salvation. That's what Jesus means. As he held that child in his arms, he thought about what that salvation would mean. And those of us who have it relatively pretty good and growing up, 21st century America, we may not fully appreciate what what Simeon may have thought as he spoke about salvation. As Simeon spoke about salvation, he was relishing in the thought that, that even though a subject of the empire, salvation meant liberation. That even though living under relative oppression, salvation meant freedom. And even though steeped in sin, he knew that salvation meant redemption and, and, and pardon. Salvation has come, Simeon realized. And salvation not just for Israel, but for all peoples. He says, a light for the Gentiles and a glory to Israel. 
You see, the common understanding was that Israel's Messiah would come and save Israel. That He'd lead Israel and and that He would restore Israel's power and, and restore Israel's might and Israel would be saved. But Simeon had been paying attention to what God was doing. And he realized that God's plan all along was to, was to bless the nations. He knew that, this, that in this child, the promise that had been made to Abraham, that his people would be a blessing to all nations on the earth, was fulfilled. And isn't that what the angels told the shepherds living out in the fields? And we'll look at that story a little bit later in this series. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. As Simeon held this child in his arms on that day and relished, rejoiced in this moment, he knew the long, long wait was over. Salvation had come down and it had, and it had come for all. The Messiah had been born. Heaven had come to earth. And with that, the, a weary world rejoiced. I've been telling you for the last several weeks that this is going to be our theme, that this is our theme for the month of December. A weary world rejoices. And I, I've encouraged you. I hope you've gone online, downloaded the, uh, uh, the e-book, the 27-day devotional journey put together by uh, a friend, Dr. Uh, Rushing, down at Riverside. And I asked permission. He said it was, it was great for us to do this and for me to share that with everyone. I encourage you to do that if you haven't already as we, as we consider this season of the year. This season of the year. Many call this the season of Advent. And I think that's okay. Advent means waiting. Waiting. This is the season of waiting. Waiting on the coming. Uh, Not just the coming of Christmas with its eggnog and its presence around the tree, but the coming of the celebration of the Messiah. And man, this year it cannot come too soon. It cannot come too soon. This year of all years, don't we need this more than ever? Don't we need the comfort of Israel? The, 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 don't we need the light of hope and the, the joy of salvation? I can't think of a better word, in fact, to describe where we are and what we're experiencing today than this word weary. We're weary, aren't we? I'm weary. I, I thank Laws for the reminder in, in the book. He writes this. He says, Our world is weary with cynicism, doubt, hate, suffering, division, sickness, and death. We're weary. We're weary. I'm weary. I, I, I'm weary of trying to figure out how to do church in a pandemic. I, I, I'm weary of... Making plans only to have to postpone them or cancel them. I'm weary of worrying about what this is going to do to the church. I'm I'm, I'm weary of wondering about those who may never come back to be with us. I'm weary of politics. I'm weary of the bitterness and the anger that's being expressed everywhere in the media, especially on social media. I'm weary of, uh, of injustice. I'm weary of racism, and I'm also weary of blame that is too often falling on good people who've given their lives to serve and to protect. I'm weary. I'm weary of being weary, aren't you? Now more than ever, we need to hear the angel voices and, and, and the voice of Simeon. My eyes have seen your salvation. I love the song that we often sing around this time of year, the the lyrics to this wonderful old hymn, O Holy Night. So captures, so expresses the emotion, doesn't it? Long lay the world in sin and error, pining till He appears 
and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, a, 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 a weary world rejoices. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees and hear the angel voices. O night divine, the night when Christ was born. O night, O holy night, O night divine. It was Christmas Day. December the 25th, 1914. Some of you have heard this story. I may have told it before. The world was in the midst of one of the bloodiest wars it had ever seen. The war to end all war wars, we thought at the time. We call it the First World War because it wasn't. But something amazing happened. Something amazing happened on this date. Uh, German and British forces stopped shooting at each other. And hearing the singing of Christmas carols from across the way, they began to rise up out of their trenches, soaked in the blood of battle, and began crossing into the area known as No Man's Land, the land of the area between them, where, for a time at least, they came together and they enjoyed conversation they joined in singing hymns of Christmas together, and even by some accounts, a game of football was played. How strange, soldiers later recalled, that Christmas had managed to bring these mortal enemies together as friends for a time. In the midst of of that dark, wearisome time, the light of Jesus managed to break through the darkness just enough to offer warmth and cheer and hope and maybe a little comfort, consolation in that time. And the good news is, the good news is it still does today. The good news of Jesus is that He still offers hope and comfort, and salvation. In fact, the story of Simeon here reminds us of a number of things. One of the things it reminds us of is that God is faithful to His promises. He keeps His word. He keeps His promises to us. But the other thing it reminds us of is that His timing is His timing. And it's not always our own. So sometimes we wait. Sometimes we wait. Simeon's visit, you'll notice too, also came with a warning for Mary especially. Look again at what he tells Mary in verse 34. He says, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now, how do you think Mary received that warning? How did she process that? How did she feel? What did, what did she think about that moment? Not everybody's going to rejoice at His coming. In fact, the honest truth is Jesus pretty well splits folks into two camps. You either accept Jesus or you reject Jesus. And the Bible is full of imagery along those lines, right? He is either a rock that you build your life on or He's one that you stumble over. And ironically, it was, so, it was, it was very often the rich folks and the powerful folks, the ones who were in charge, who were in control, and even the religious folks who were often the ones to stumble. And it was the poor and the lame and the weary that Jesus would lift up. Not everybody rejoiced at His coming. In fact, there would be opposition. And, and in Luke's gospel here anyway, the first indication, the first indication that, that things may not go all that well for Jesus, we, we know that we know that very soon Mary and Joseph would make the decision to flee to Africa to 
keep Jesus safe from Herod's order of infanticide. Matthew tells us that account. But even Luke, uh, just a couple of chapters over, when the, after they've returned from Egypt, Jesus is rejected after preaching his sermon at, at his hometown synagogue. He's rejected and even thrown out of town. We know that he would face opposition. And eventually, Simeon warned, he would pierce the heart of his parents. Now, I'm not sure I've experienced this myself, but I feel like I've been with some parents whose hearts have been pierced. And I think about Mary in this moment. What, what, did, what, did, Mary, what did Mary think would happen? There's this wonderful scene in the movie, The Passion of the Christ. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but I remember this scene well. The scene at the end of the movie where Mary is watching as Jesus is beaten, as he is tortured, and he's mocked, and he's made to carry a cross there on the, the way to Golgotha. And there's this moment in the In this scene where Jesus stumbles over the weight of the cross on his back. And he he falls on his face. And the viewer is, is taken from Mary's point of view immediately back into a flashback. Moms know this, right? And in Mary's mind's eye, she sees little Jesus as a As a boy running around and playing like boys do, and he stumbles and he falls, and he, he, and, he, and he hurts his knee, and he starts to cry, and yet Mary is there, and she comes to him, and she picks him up, and she dusts him off, and she makes everything better, right? Because that's what mothers do. But she can't pick him up at this time. She can't pick him up. She can't make it all better. The crowds and the soldiers are mocking him. They're shouting insults at him. And she has to watch as he carries that cross, now helped by a one who has been called out of the crowd to help him. And she watches him carry that, watches them carry that to Golgotha, where she watches him being nailed to that cross and then lifted up. And the irony is. That it was the pain of the cross that makes the story of Bethlehem complete. It is is that the promise of the manger is fulfilled at the cross. And the consolation of Israel would finally be realized in the death of the Lamb. And as the prophet Isaiah had said, and it's by his wounds... We are healed. And we're not told if Simeon was there on that occasion. We're not told about Joseph. It's presumed they're both gone. But we know Mary was there. Mary was there. And don't you know her soul was pierced. This morning as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper together. If your soul is hurting I urge you to find consolation in Jesus. If you're waiting this morning, wait no more, but take hold of the salvation that He offers in His name. And if you're weary, and if you're weary, come to Jesus and find rest for your soul. Give us an opportunity to pray for you. If we can encourage you, This morning, won't you let us know how we can serve you? Let's stand together and sing.
I think one of the uh, cleanest renderings of language that relates to the Lord's Supper is that that we find in 1 Corinthians 11. Read some of that to you as we prepare our minds this morning as well. Starting in verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Y'all take your top layer and peel it back. We'll reveal the bread. If you'd bow with me, please. Father, as we gather around your table, we praise you for who you are. We praise you for your son who instituted this supper for us. We're thankful that we can see so clearly what we ought to do as we gather. And as we eat of the body of Christ today, help us do so in a manner that's worthy of remembering him well. Help us remember his life, his death, his resurrection until he returns. In Christ's name, amen. Again from 1 Corinthians, after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Let's pray. For life in Christ, Father, we give you praise. For our debt that was nailed to the cross in Calvary, we give you glory and honor. For the sacrifice of your Son, we are truly thankful. And as we drink this cup, which is to us his blood, we pray that we remember all the sacrifices that were made and the joy in sharing this supper with you again someday. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Each and every week we have an opportunity to purpose in our hearts to give. I hope that you've had an opportunity to reflect upon that this week and do that today. Um, our trays for receiving those gifts are in the aisle way. I'll sure be glad when we get through saying that. I'm weary of having to say that on Sunday morning. But if y'all would, we'll, we'll have a prayer about the contribution at this time, please. Father God, we know that all good gifts come from you. And as much as this time makes us weary, we are a blessed people indeed. We praise you for all the blessings that you give for us. And we pray that as we purpose to return a portion of those, we do that with the measure of your spirit. So that your kingdom can be furthered, spread, and enhanced by use of these funds. Help us to give cheerfully and in the right spirit. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Announcements for today. Tim Sims is at home and is improving. Norman Atchison from the Manuelito Navajo Children's Home was dismissed to home. Madonna Eldridge, Hannah Osteen's mother, is undergoing treatments for breast cancer. Please keep her in your prayers. Ms. Marlene Thomas couldn't be with us this morning because she's out sick. Please keep her in your prayers. Congratulations to Ross and Cody DeJarnett on the birth of their daughter, Campbell Louise, familiar name. On Wednesday, November the 11th, 
Campbell Louise weighed seven pounds, 13 ounces. Congratulations also to the grandparents, Alan and Leigh DeJarnett, and great grandfather, Daddy Bob. It's bags a blessing time again for us this year, and we're handling the matter a little differently. We're asking for monetary donations to be made, and we will order the food and the gift cards. Then our youth will assemble the bags as a service project this year. If you know someone who is in need of a food bag, please contact the church office to make sure that all those needs are fulfilled. And the ladies' ornament swap will be on Monday, December the 7th at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, I'm assuming that appropriate social distancing will occur uh, for that event, but you still should be able to look forward to it, ladies. It ought to be a good uh, time, hopefully, to be had by all of you tomorrow evening. If there are no other announcements, we'll be dismissed in prayer at this time. Father, as we leave here in benediction from this service, we pray that you give us feet to walk for you this week, a heart to feel needs of those who are in sin, an opportunity to counsel with and console those who are hurting, and Father, a place to increase Christ in our life by the way that we walk each and every day. Forgive us, dear Lord, of those things that we don't do well and of those opportunities that we miss Help rise us up, lift us up, and keep us ever in your care. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.